All right, so um, today we're doing a little bit of kind of cleanup stuff. Um, we wanted to discuss again, uh, first of all, we had um, asked about OLR to look into okay, the- So um, today we're doing a little bit of kind of cleanup stuff. Um, we want, is there an echo? It should be okay now. Oh, okay. Um, talking about the, uh, I want to, we want to start out with the uh, workforce survey findings. And uh, to say that Lori and I have been working on this um, in the, uh, trying to get this up and ready for your review. But these are some of the things we wanted to go through before we um, bring the finished project, pro the finished product forward. So um, if you recall, um, the, the staff perspectives, uh, the reason that we had the whole thing was, the whole survey was to, uh, to um, kind of examine complaints and other reports of discriminatory employment practices at the hospitals and excerpt any information or documentation not subject to disclosure under the Freedom of Information Act. So what we did was we looked at some of, you know, they, they did a kind of lay it out there for us, but we wanted to talk to you about what your thoughts were on some of the, uh, the findings. And uh, we, we, um, we kind of broke it out into uh, the worker morale um, findings. And then we also kind of grouped together under bullying and then management. Um, one, I think we've identified this, but just wanted to check it out with everybody, see if we're all on the same page. Um, an important and clear message, we're talking about worker morale. Um, do, does anybody, do you need to look at your, this was actually lifted completely from their report. Um, so it definitely was an important and clear message is that uh, CVH and Whiting uh, employees like the work that they do and they get intrinsic satisfaction from the work. Most of they said they understood the nature of what is expected of them and how they fit into the organization mm -hmm. and for the most, and get along for the most part with their colleagues. That was one of the findings that came from this that they like what they do, they know what they're doing. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Moving right along. That uh, one third of the respondents agreed that um, place was a good place to work, both Whiting and uh, CVH. And only a minority of, uh, of employees reported they had the resources they needed to perform their job well in terms of the physical conditions of the workplace and material support. So you had one third of the group saying that they thought it was a good place to work. And then you had uh, what they quote unquote, only a minority of employees reported that they had the resources they needed to perform their work. But one third is a minority anyway. Absolutely. So I'm not, the way you read it, sounded as if you were trying to state that those two concepts, those two phrases were contradictory, but they're not. Well, actually, as I said, we lifted this right from the findings. So let's- I know, let's, but if we, don't like, if we don't like the findings, we can right. rewrite them for our own right, report. Right. That's exactly it. What was our impression of the findings? Yeah. Can I just clarify, like it, the way they, had, they put this in the report, um, these aren't meant to be contradictory. These are two separate things. Yeah, these are two separate we can, findings. We can two separate separate them from the as a result, of, yeah. result of the data. Like that a third of people said they like the way, like where they work. And then a separate question or a separate item, um, separate data was that people feel they don't have the, enough resources to do their work. So it should be two separate Dr. sentences. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Rodas. Yeah, I think what's missing, um, you know, I agree with Nancy's comment. I think what's missing is the word only. If we just started that first sentence with the word only, 
I think we'll all be good. Only one third of employees felt mm-hmm. they you know, like yeah. working there. Yeah. And and a minority left small, and I actually put the number, whatever it is, right. because clearly then it's less than a third, I assume, uh, you know, only 10%, 15%, whatever. I can't remember what that number was, felt they had adequate uh, supplies, materials, or whatever environment to do the work. I, I think that I, it's I, a sense of different message. Uh, actually, I, I, you, okay, I, I think that's kind of misleading because it's a third of all respondents. Where if you look at the the people that have witnessed bullying in the last six months, that's twenty four percent of all employees. Well, we just we we, we have bullying later, right? Okay, but, so but I think it, I think I think twenty four percent of all employees versus a third of all respondents is misleading in its representation. Well, I think it's fair. The, I think it's fair, Linda. In surveys, when you answer this, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, to interrupt, Lori. I should wait until I'm called upon. No, that's okay. But Go ahead. I, Dr. I think. Robert. I think. Uh, I think Paul's point is important. I think when you're talking about the respondents, when you because all surveys, you only get a quarter to a half at the best. Right. Day, people. Excellent respond. point, Paul. So you're I think it's. Right. I think it's fair to say, one third of respondents. You know, or or better yet, only one third of respondents. So that sends the message. So you know, because you really never know what the other folks, the folks didn't respond to, because in the first, in the preamble, we're going to say we had so many people responded, it went to this many people, so many responded, and then you go into the, the data. When you have actually hard data about the percent of employees, that's a, to Paul's point, that's a, that's a very clear and different distinction. Point well taken, point well taken. Uh, so if we, even starting out with the first one, we'll just say, uh, an important and clear message that is that CVH and, and VH um, Whiting employees that responded, respondents, like the work that they do. And, I, and we can pull out what was the actual reported percentage. And I'm not sure, do you think, I mean, if we were writing an article for publication, we'd probably say who the respondents were. Do you want us to put that in there? No? You know, like, how well, many when you say who, well, normally what I do is write the number. So I would write 24% and then parentheses okay. 24 out of 100 or or vice versa, 24 out of 100 parentheses 27%. Because I, 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 percentage could be misleading. If you only got three respondents. And well, the I think said, what yeah, we might do, right? we might write at the top of the highlight. Uh, all right. Okay. This um, in the paragraph before what we have in here is that, you know, uh, we're going to put in the Appendix B, the complete details analysis of the, of the uh, survey, but this is what we have. The survey used a descriptive design which involved analysis of collected data to describe ex- existing situations and environment, period. Although the survey team emailed links to the survey to 1,520 CVH white, whiting employees the response rate was only 27%. So that put that frames it. Yes, Lori. Yeah, so I, I was just going to interject, like, before we even get to, like, when, when we're describing this part of the, in, in our report, we'll start out by saying, like, that Dr. Kai and her colleagues did this survey, and here's the sample. It was this many respondents, you know, um, over this period of time and that kind of thing, and it's 27% of the workforce. And then, so that, frames it for the reader that we're talking about a quarter of the workforce responded to this survey. Then when we detail the results, we can use the word respondents because we're, we're referring to a third of the respondents, a third of the respondents, this percentage of the respondents. However, the whole point of surveys is to generalize the larger population, right? So the reader can take from that to say, you know, they, they, they can hold both ideas in their head at the same time. The idea that, okay, this is meant to generalize to how employees feel across the hospitals, keeping in the back of their mind that, okay, we're still talking about only a quarter of people responded. So the other 73% may feel differently, but you have to, you know, you you can't just dismiss all the results because only that many responded. And you also don't want to assume that that characterizes the entire picture. So, okay, Nancy and then Paul. 
Just one small point that when you talk at the beginning that it went to X number of Zemus employees, you're going to have to, I think, articulate who those employees are. We're not talking about secretaries. We're not talking about janitorial okay. staff. We're, right. So say what what the jobs specifically were so we get a sense of yeah, who this I, population is. Yeah, I think that's is. a very good, very good point. Okay. Yes, Lori? And, and uh, yeah, I would just say to that, like, you know, we want, we don't want to like detail the entire survey report in our report. We're trying to like, you know, summarize things. So we'll kind of say it more succinctly, but then be able to refer to the larger survey where people can go and read all the details of, you know, this number of, uh, you know, mental health staff uh, versus psychiatry, psychology, you know, like. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yes, Dr. Otis. And then Paul. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Paul. You were, you were supposed Paul, to go after Paul, go, 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 go ahead, John. Uh, yeah, I don't want to be a pest and, and uh, nitpicking, but so this time you actually inserted the word only, which I wouldn't have, because I think to Lori's point, when you do surveys, you're never going to get 100%. And actually, I didn't insert it. I just, I'm just oh, reporting no, it the way well, it is. No, I'm sorry. I, I apologize for using that word. That was, that was incorrect. So All right, would, I, they, uh, they use the word only. I wouldn't say only 27% because I think that undermines everything to follow. You know, it implies that eh, it's just a very small sample. Lori's point is exactly right. When you do a survey like this and you survey everybody, whatever the respondents are, your the intention is. In, if it's an adequate sample size and 27% by everybody's, I think, definition of what's an adequate sample of a survey, then generalizes. And the assumption you actually make is that all those other people would have responded the same way. You know, Similarly, we can debate all yeah. we can debate all day whether that's true or not, but that's the information you have. I just I wouldn't use the word only in that regard because I just think it underlines what I, I have it circled already. Thank you. Because if we're gonna we're not gonna use only twice in the same paragraph. <laughs> right. But go ahead, Paul. But I would I would even go as far as to argue its importance. So if a third of all respondents, you know, reported this, ninety percent of respondents reported seeing someone being bullied. And and to me, ninety percent of respondents, which by the way, equates to twenty five percent of the entire or twenty four percent of the entire employee total. I think that that's more seminal in the report than a third of all respondents like their job. Okay. I, I wait till we get to that part. You might be surprised what it's. Um, so um, I'm going to flip this, Lori, from what we had. Uh, the next point was mental health assistance for 49% of the respondents who wrote an open-ended comment mentioning worker morale with the vast majority of comments being unfavorable, including phrases such as the organizational culture is toxic and everyone is miserable from the top down, morale does not exist. And uh, another point that was in that uh, same was in general, overall worker morale was lower for employees who do most of their work in direct patient care. And that carries through in a lot of different places. All right, so we're going on now to bullying. Uh, survey responses. Can I, say, Linda, yes. can I just say something about the work and morale part? Yep. Um, I think the important, you know, sort of overarching message from this, like without kind of getting into all the numbers, is people, people really like what they do. And for the most part, they like who they work with. But they feel like they don't have enough resources to do their job. They're not supported in their job. They feel that it's not managed well and that kind of thing, that they're not included in decisions and, that, and, and those kinds of things. So it's, it's almost like people are just really struggling to get by. They like what they do, but they're sort of like, it's almost like they're grasping well, at straws to try, to try to do it meaningfully because they feel like they're not supported in the overarching um, system. Okay. Um, I don't know. Let me look here. So, so the, the, the problem with that is two thirds of the respondents didn't say that. You're, a third of the respondents said that they liked their job and that they didn't feel like they had enough resources. Two thirds of their respondents didn't. No, I, it says, um, so the, the one of the first points that the, that 
Dr. Wakai made was that the majority of the respondents said that they do like the work that they do. They, 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 they like working with the patients. They, um, that was the first paragraph that Linda was referring to. The part where it said only a third was where it asked if it was a good place to work. So there's a separation between like the work that you do <laughs> and the overall system in which you work. And, and that's what I think is a, an important, clear distinction to make. People like the work they do. They like working with patients. They took these jobs because they care about that. It's the overarching system in which they work that makes it difficult. Dr. Votis. Yeah, and just, just I only say this for folks who haven't been the healthcare survey space, healthcare employees, that what Lori just said is not, some people might think that's, but that's um, uh, a conflict, but it's not. It's very, very, very common, uh, indeed, probably in all workplaces, but I only know about healthcare, that 90 plus percent of people actually like the work they do. They like the people they work with because you know, otherwise most people would, would leave, frankly. Most people, if you're miserable at what you do, and, and you know, and then the management whole question or the morale is, is actually totally different. So I think it's not, it's not um, uh, contradictory, I guess. I just want to just make that clear. It's okay to say those two things. Um, I also went through the PERCH report, which if you remember was a, a report that was done prior to all this. And um, I have, um, it, it's a little bit better done and not so, it, what it was saying was, and I have no idea I, that um, it kind of supports the notion that um, 58 percent of the people in that um, survey agree that co-workers treat each other with respect and dignity, but they were split because the supervisors treated the employees with uh, more of the like the mental health aides and the FTSs and uh, just different. They treated them different than they did the um, disciplines like the psychiatrist and so forth. And um, I'm, I'm toying with the idea of also putting this in here too, because in our report, mostly because it's, a, it, it's more, a little bit more descriptive than what we're talking about here. It's not this generalization for, um, and they do give 49% of the people in their district uh, disagree with the hospital with the statement the hospital deals effectively with disrespectful behavior kind of kind of folds into what we just uh, will be talking about so um just as a comparison yes when was that so linda i'm a little um I'm not confused but that was in 2017 right and it was done by um wasn't it a team from yale Students of Yale at Yale who did this? No, it was Perch. What is Perch? Perch is the um, program uh, for recovery and community yeah, pro health. Yeah, program oh, okay. for recovery and community health. So my only my only concern, I guess, is um, and I'm all listen. I'm all for tracking and trending, right? But not with different survey tools uh, done years apart, uh, and I don't even know if it was the same, I'm trying to think, 17, was that even the same management? Uh, no. Well, I think, I think it kind think, of, it kind of is a, it's a snapshot of before. It's like a before. Right. I, I just, you, you understand my point though, right? I, you know, if we're gonna, if we're gonna imply some, this is worse or this is better based on two different surveys, on two different times by two different folks with different questions, it may be, you know, it may confuse, I guess, the reader. Cause you know, our task was survey the staff and and find out what they said. And we did that. And I, I think to throw in something that's now five years old or four years old, probably five years old by the time we're done, it, it's gonna be, it may be a little uh, confusing, but I'm, but I'm curious what the others think. It, it, I agree with, with John, I'm sorry, Paul. Uh, no I, agree with John. I agree with John, especially because of all of everything that happened in the interim. Um, there were very public trials um people were fired um and there in 2017 there was information out about the um the abuse 
um, but I don't think to the same extent that we now know it. And so I, I think we're talking about a, um, a very different um, sense of what the place was and what was expected of I, I people. Think, I think if you looked at it, you would see that it is very much almost an insidious and uh, uh, the same kind of thing was happening in 2017. And that, it, it, that we see here. I'm not saying it's, it wasn't happening, but it wasn't with the same kind of public scrutiny and public outcry. I know, um, but the, my point would be nothing has changed even with the outcry. That nothing's changed in 50 years. Really? Yeah. No, seriously. I That's mean, we, 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 we were hearing reports about this, about stuff like that this at CBH back in the 80s, back in the 90s, back in the 2000s. And so yeah. I think that I think the thing with the Perch report is it was very um, it was it was done just after uh, the Bill Shahadi story broke. So it was still in this kind of transition of, oh, my God, this is what just happened here type phase. Yeah, the, the report itself came out in December of 2017, but yeah, the focus groups themselves took place, you know, probably in the, in the three months or so before that. Um, so yeah, it was it did provide kind of a snapshot of the hospital as it was kind of going through this. Um, you know, I, I I I don't think we should make a whole lot of it, but I, I think it is. Uh, I guess maybe just important as a reference point to say there were some similar themes. Like, yes, completely different methodologies, completely different administrations, completely different, you know, we're now four years later, but but I do think that there is a point to saying there are some consistent uh, themes. How about this? Kind of I, I, I'm willing to type this up, what I gleaned from the Perch report and circulated. I think you will see. And I think that's kind of, I have to tell you that the theme that I am seeing working here is what we are seeing and what we are is not new. It's not new. What is, you know, we, you could do reports from now till the cows come home. But it's time, it's time that the state of Connecticut shows the political and moral will to do something about this. Oh, I agree, I agree with you 100%, Linda. But, but the problem is, I don't think they have, I don't think the, I think massive structural changes need to be done to inpatient care period. Um, and, and I don't think anything that we're coming up with is going to provide that level of structural change that's needed. I, I also found something, as you probably mentioned many years ago when I was much younger in Spryer, I was a public health nurse on the streets of, New, of, of Norwich. Were and you? I had a grant. Huh? Were you? Yeah, I was. I worked for United Community Services, and we had a grant uh, from the state that I, the psychiatric nurses could see anybody who was coming out of Norwich House. And, and, and so it gave us a lot of latitude to really help people that were not connected to the service. You know, Reliance House, I used to be there every Wednesday afternoon going over medica medications and helping people to get their medications and understand. But that was a time when there was, seemed to be a lot more emphasis on helping people to be successful in the community. And it wasn't, it wasn't expensive. So I also happened upon a document about what was uh, some of the uh, programs that the state pr provided at that time. And I, I will be glad to send it all to you because we have to flesh out a lot better than we have. What do we actually need in the community? You know, I, I had a, I can tell you that you can say someone has a place to live and we all know this, but is it a place you would want? Is it somewhere you would like to see a member of your family house? That, that didn't always happen. And it was, it was actually supported by the state. So um, I will send these two documents that I have. Uh, it's not, it, the, the purchase is not a big, big report, but it does kind of 
support what we have we have realized ourselves. And I and I think the message here is um, we all come from different aspects of this question, but we have found some things that have been going on for years. And the, the answer here is, um, does Connecticut want to change? Yes. I do think to Paul's point and your point about this, I do think after we summarize the findings of the survey, I, I do think it's worth telling the legislators, informing them, for those who don't know the history and have only been here for, you know, in office for a couple of years, saying, you know, these findings are very consistent with a long standing pattern of results of surveys over, you know, our whatever the whatever we can support with evidence and reference um, to make it clear that to the, all the points everyone's making, this could go on for a long time. And unless you want to do another one of these task force in five years and come up with yeah, some just, results. Just to say you did something. It's time It's time to actually take action. It's enough enough talk, enough meetings, and you know, it's now it's time to take action. I think, which is Paul's point. I, I think that's what I've been coming, you know, going over our work and looking what we've what we've listened to, I I do think that um, that that it is consistent over time. And I would say to the folks that have been working in the field here, have we found something that's different or new that we didn't know? No. No. And and are we coming forward with some uh, with some really good recommendations that could change it? You betcha. Can I just add one thing that I think is, whether it's really new or not, I'm not sure, but there is this undercurrent of what it clears, what's clear to me, at least uh, this racial tension among people who are employed at the hospital. And, and I'm not sure that's been teased out in the past. It seems like you get some indicators of that in this employee survey. Certainly anecdotally, uh, I'm confident that each one of us has heard directly from people on this topic and and I just hope that 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 issue gets mentioned uh, in ultimately as we explain the take I think it does go it goes when we go through this um yes we do talk about we do talk about let's do you, uh, can we we'll move I on point to out because I think that's new that, that hasn't been addressed in the past okay Linda? Yes. I'm wondering if it might, um, rather than kind of like talking about some of the findings that might go into the report here, if it would make more sense, like for us to say if we have other like bullet point recommendations that um, like for consideration among everybody, like, I, you know, we started to talk about a couple of things last time, but I'm wondering if that, um, like well, we have like I, kind of I'm hard and kinda, fast. I like it. Let me just say this. When I saw the um, agenda and I saw, you know, this is how I had fleshed it out. I am not sure that folks have um, done that. And um, I, I, while I would like them all to come to their own conclusions and um, I just wanted to discuss some of the salient points that I uh, think we should include in it, but I'm not, it's not to the exclusion of anything. It's just to get us and it has been very successful in getting us to talk about it. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So the next thing we have is bullying. That, that was one, one of the findings. And while this is, this is just not, this is, as I said, I lifted this out of the report. So here we go. Um, bullying, under bullying, the survey responses revealed a substantial amount of incivility and or bullying at CVH and WFH, almost 90% reporting at least one nonviolent uncivil behavior in the past six months. The second one, a clear majority of respondents, and I agree in our, our report, we should say how many and what percent. But a clear majority of the respondents re reported witnessing bullying of coworkers by managers, supervisors, peers, or supervisees. 
approximately a quarter of respondents reported experiencing negative behaviors from managers or coworkers. Yes, Paul. Um, when they when they say peers, um, I think they we need to say coworkers as opposed to peers because that's a very specific uh, job. Okay. Anything else? You're all going to read this before it goes out, but um, so the next one was the threats of violence were more commonplace from managers or coworkers with 10% experiencing them, and we should put respondents to right, ex experiencing them at least occasionally in the past six months. The next one is employees were more likely to report experiencing violence or physical abuse in the past six months if they were non-white or spent a majority of their time in direct patient care. And the next point was witnessing any bullying of coworkers was experienced more often by CDH employees, younger employees, and whites. Witnessing any bullying of coworkers was experienced more often by CDH employees, younger employees, and whites. Any comments? With the, I think it was the second bullet point that you read. Could you read that again? Um, about the clear majority uh, of respondents uh, witnessing bullying of coworkers by managers or threats of violence were more commonplace from managers or coworkers. There was something where I thought it was a little too vague and, and general that um, a, a lot of these are sort of, um, and I understand that you're taking it from the report, but the, the language is, is very general and is not the kind yeah, of specific yes. language that you would expect to get from a report. So what does the majority mean? What does, I think there's a, a word occasional in there. Um, let me see. I'm not sure. Yes. Yeah, what does that with, mean? With, it's the threats of violence were more commonplace from managers or coworkers with 10% experiencing them at least occasionally. In the yeah, what does that mean? I, I mean, well, experiencing it once is, wrong, is too much. So what does occasional mean? Well, I think that's the way the questions are written. And I, and I think if we went back and looked at the actual survey, we would see probably how they defined occasionally on the survey. I can't remember. They may not. They may have just said like, we'll check that out. Never, once, occasionally, a lot. I mean, it just depends on what the anchors were. But again, I, you know, I think we, we want to be careful about how, um, and, and what Linda was taking these points from was their summary. So like, the, you know, they provided the data throughout the whole report and then they had these like paragraphs at the end that were summaries. So it's common to use like more general language when you're trying to summarize the points because you're trying to give people in a few sentences, like here's the snapshot of. Well, um, I think another thing, I, you know, they did not have, it, they did not have enough people participate to have st statistical significance. And, you know, sometimes they can use that. And so when you, then you're you're backing down to the comparison, and um, but I agree. We should we should report in our report what was in the report, saying how many people or what was said here, as as near as we can conceptualize it from the data that we have. That is to say, if they did define occasionally, then we would say occasionally that the in in parentheses with them. Usually in surveys where there's any quantification implied, they, there's never, occasionally, often, always, <laughs> something like that, usually. So I, we'd have to go back and look at the actual questions to be clear. Uh, but you know, to Nancy's point, it's not like we're saying, oh, don't worry about it, it only happens occasionally. It's still, you know, I think the point's made. 10% of people said they're occasionally have bullying. That's a lot. 
That's a lot. Even once is too much. I go, we all agree. Yes. In a, in a setting like this, yes. Yeah, I think um, I think that's the bigger point is it doesn't matter whether it happened, it's happening one time or 17 times, it's happening. And people are experiencing it, people are witnessing it, and it's coloring the their work experience. And I think we have to get back to remembering, and I'll just I'll be somewhat crass about this. I don't care as much um, if it's coloring their work experience. That's not, frankly, I mean, yes, I know that's part of our charge, but frankly, I'm worried about how it colors the life experience of the people who are incarcerated there. Um, and so I think, you know, the more we talk about uh, the survey, we and when we write about it, we have to keep bringing it back to what this all reflects is how the patients are treated. And that patients who are bullied and patients who are abused and patients who are neglected is the fault of the staff, period. Um, and um, since we've now got a survey that um, that acknowledges that that's what staff, not all staff, but some staff are doing. That's that's what this is about, and that's what we've discovered, and that's what we. I'm not sure that we can um, change um, what the staff are doing in in. Um, with our little task force. Um, but this survey really um, makes it clear that what patients are experiencing, patients are experiencing this from staff. And that's the root of the problem. Well, if you're working in a place where all this is going on, sometimes people feel free to just go ahead and be um, pejorative to the, the patients. It's, it's, I think what, what, what I was getting as I was reading this was, they may say it's a great place to work, but I'm not so sure it is. Maybe it's a great place to work for a few people, but it sure ain't a great place to be a patient. And I'm and more it, and worried it colors, about whether it colors or not the whole atmosphere. And so when, uh, I think as we go through, let's, let's go through management. I I, I kind of, I kind of agree with Linda on this because I think the toxicity permeates both places and it's affecting staff it's affecting management and in the end it's affecting the people that have to reside there. and so they feel like they can just do whatever they want to to the patients yeah. and so yeah. you really have to correct the root of what's happening here if it's if it is something that is um oh a, you know a wink and a nod then who is winking and nodding is it the supervisors that's what that, and, so that's I, I think in, in the end result, Nancy, is definitely what happens to the patient. But it's right, the that's, that's the bottom line. Yeah, that's right. the bottom line. Uh, yeah, 100%. And, 100%. and 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 I think, too, I mean, you know, I've heard stories from from people that have worked there a long time um, of this. You know, like I said, going back to the 80s, the 90s, you know, 2000s, that it hasn't changed. And I don't think that it's a tweak. I don't. It's it's too. It's been too pervasive there too long to think that we're going to come up with a couple of recommendations that are going to tweak this and make it all better. Right. In, in, in actuality, I agree with you, Paul. Yeah. Yes, Doctor Rodas. Yeah, I. You know, I think we've said this before, but I 100% I agree with these comments. We, when you have a place that's been mired, stuck in the mud, whatever, in a certain pattern for a long time. Uh, you, the only way you're going to get out of it is with a cultural transformation. And it's not easy. Uh, it starts with the top. It, it's a lot of education. It's a zero tolerance kind of policy for some of these things we're talking about. It's enforcing of those policies. And uh, I can tell you from experience, it can be done. It can be done. It's not easy. Uh, it's well, hard work, but it can be done. But I, I think that's what we're talking about here. If we don't do it, there's going to be some little incremental, little tweak, and maybe a new facility, which will be nice. Was not going to solve the underlying problems. Lori, I'm I would sorry. just say, I, as I was going through this, I was thinking by 
uh, recommending the uh, Office of the Inspector General and that there is a, a, a process by which people can complain and that those complaints will be heard and that the, somebody will do something about it is, is probably the biggest gift we're gonna give this. And I, I don't know, Mike, what do you think? I had to unmute. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, to me, you know, a couple of things have led to the, the, the creation of our task force, right? And obviously one was what happened to Mr. Shahadi. Uh, and, and I think that the inspector general uh, capability will you know, make it less likely that repeats itself and, and will give um, patients, their family members and their advocates a, a, a real sort of avenue to put some teeth into a, a, a complaint or an investigation. And, you know, I, I, the other thing, and you know, you've heard me harp on this before, which in my view is one of the bigger recommendations we can make is urge the state to, to consider um, developing a, you know, different physical plan to provide these medical services, not just at Whiting either. And because it's just, you know, for those of us who've been there, especially Whiting, it's just really um, suboptimal to say the least, right? So it reminds me of an old cavalry barn. Yeah, it's pretty bad. So. Okay. I, yes, Dr. Hauser. Uh, well, I actually had a question for John, because you said that um, when you're talking about the cultural shift or whatnot, that you said it can be done, it's not easy, but it can be done and you have experience and that can, can you say a little bit more about that piece or, or how it was able to be done in your perspective? No, I think Nancy kind of, I think Nancy hit an important point because if this, if the, and I don't wanna to get too specific about where and when, but I worked at a hospital once <laughs> that if someone was, if you were wondering the hallway is lost, people would just walk right by you or staff would walk right by you. And that same place today, if you stopped in the hall to check the time on your, I guess I can't say watch anymore, but on your cell phone, everybody who walked by would say, can I help you, can I help you, can I help you. That's, that's an example. Now, you might say, well, what's got to do with patient care? But it's that same mentality when a call bell is going off and somebody's asking for help. People would walk right by the room and not respond because like, ah, you know, who knows, they're being pain in the neck and you know, they want another whatever and, you know. No, it's like somebody there needs help. So, you know, so you have to translate that call, that message to, you know, what's the message we're sending people? Um, these are patients. We're taking them into our homes as the way, you know, the metaphor I would use. And just if you had a guest come to your house, you would make sure you had clean sheets and clean towels and a new bar of soap and, and all of that. And, you know, I think that's it. So it, take, it takes, it takes reading Actually, the response, I think what, what Linda said is very important. You can't just give lip service. You can't just listen to people complain, right? Because that doesn't do, that, that helps, by the way. I mean, just listening to people complain actually helps them a little bit because they get to vent. But then you have to do something about it because otherwise you're going to hear the same complaint over and over and over again. And you have to go to the root cause. And, and you know, there's got to be some um, repercussions, for folks that clearly and wantonly violate the code of ethics, principles, morality, whatever you want to call it, policies, procedures, there has to be some consequences. Or at the end of the day, people are going to say they don't do anything about it. And then everything, unfortunately, I'd like to think people rise up to this highest level they can. My experience is people all fall down to the lowest common denominator and they say, well, they don't care. So why should I care? And, and right. so it's, it does, it's how you treat each other. It's how you treat visitors. It's how you treat patients. It's all the same. It's all varying on the theme. And, it, you know, it, it's a culture it, of safety. It's a culture of quality. It's a culture of taking good care of people. Um, it's civility. It's all of that. And that's what I meant, Laurie. But it, it, like it, I said, it takes, it, and, what and I just said, it takes to, a few you, years. <laughs> I, I would say it also comes from the leadership, whether they pay attention to what's going on. It's kind of stunning how long Mr. Shahadi's problems were going on. But at the same time, in other in other Connecticut departments, similar things were going on. We had a substance abuse treatment program. Okay, think about this: substance abuse treatment program for veterans at Rocky Hill, and within walking distance, we had a bar on the same hill where that where it was. And so, if you uh, were in the substance abuse program, it was packed, always packed. 
So we ask why. Well, you see, if you got rowdy in the bar, okay, then they throw you out for two weeks and then you'd have to go through the substance abuse treatment program and then they will allow you to come back and drink more. Think about that. I would just, if I could just make one more, one more, that's an interesting anecdote, Linda, thank you. But I think <laughs> one more, one more comment I would make, and, and to, I think Mike alluded to this. The physical plant is, is not the problem, but it's part of the problem and it indeed will be part of the solution. Uh, you know, again, we've made it very clear. We shouldn't just assume that's gonna fix the problem because it's not. But, but think of the message you're sending to everybody who walks in there every day, that like we walked in, you park your car and you walk in, What's the message to the employees? What's the message to the patients when you're when you're in that environment? It's like the answer. I could tell you what I would feel is they don't care about us. They don't care about me. Um, and whether it's the facilities for the staff or the facilities for the patients, at the end of the day, the message is nobody cares about us. So again, I, I don't want to you know be hyperbolic. I just think when you're talking about years and years and years of surveys and and committees and task force coming up with the same conclusion, you, you can only include one thing that a, a change, a, a significant change to Paul's point needs to be made. Yes, Paul. Yeah, I mean, no, I definitely agree with that because, you know, put, putting sour milk in a new refrigerator doesn't make it fresh. And so, you know, we, there has to be other parts of this process and we have to look at what we're actually doing in the service system. Um, and, and I agree with you. I mean, I, I think, you know, there's going to be no easy solution to that, but I think there's some easy, like low hanging fruit that we can start with. Um, but yeah, without a, without a doubt. Okay. Yes, Lori. Yeah, and I guess I'll just echo the, um, I think, you know, we've already come up with a couple overarching things. I mean, one is the physical plant. And again, like you said, well, that doesn't solve the problem. It's part of it. It kind of, it touches a lot of other things, you know, contributes to a lot of other problems. The other, another huge thing is the staffing issue that we talked about. You know, if you sort of fix that from the top down, that addresses a number of other problems that involve patient care. If you don't have adequate staffing, you're not going to be able to, you know, we talked about that. Um, having accountability and having uh, certain things have to be reported to various entities and then be made public. I mean, like those, I think these are all sort of overarching steps that we can, that we're recommending. We have a, you know, a, a whole lot of, you know, kind of individual recommendations in this report. There are like these overarching things that I think will help to trickle down to other things. And like you said, it will take time. But I think we have a good layout. Okay, so I'm gonna just move right along to what was said about management. Employees were generally po positive towards their teams with clear majorities indicating that they enjoyed working on their team and found their colleagues easy to get along with. The general view of team cohesion and support did not differ by employee demographics or job characteristics except for gender. Feel females reported lower team cohesion and support in general compared to males. Second one, few employees reported feeling discriminated because of age, gender, or race. Almost 30% of non-white employees, think about this, almost 30% of non-white employees reported feeling discriminated because of race, which was four times the proportion of whites. So we do need to put in how many we're talking about here. And, but and it so says what, something to your point, Mike. Yeah, and, and can I just add to that? Uh, you know, my review of those responses indicated that that sense was really concentrated the lower down the totem, the lower down the professional totem pole you went. And, and, and so I, I think finding a way to convey that part of the Can summary. you just write that up and send it to me and we'll put it in here? Yeah, I, I might be yes, reluctant. I agree with you. I agree with you. Poll, but yeah, yeah I'll, I'll try and indicate. <laughs> well, you can, but your point is is right, right on. I think I think it is in there, Linda. Like in some of the things that we had talked about, um, oh. it, it, with regard to 
discrimination um, because one of the things I had was that uh, management was assessed more negatively by employees who worked overtime, especially if it was right. man mandatory, which equates to less than a quarter care. of respondents same, indicated same. that they had confidence in management and less than a fifth believed the management valued constructive criticism. Overall management was assessed more negatively by employees who worked overtime, especially if it was mandatory. And comments related to management were made, comments, by 69% of the respondents, and they had one central theme, management does not support in any way, especially upper management. And the one that I didn't read from that was almost 80% of the respondents indicated staff shortages were common on their unit. Employees who worked at Whiting and spent a majority of their time working directly with patients and those who worked overtime, especially if it was mandatory, rated the adequacy of staffing more negatively. That, that's kind of logical. Yeah, so I, th I think in general, the, the some of the more negative so, opinions or, or perspectives or whatnot it came from the the, so, the ranks so that were involved in direct patient care. I, I do think you should that it it's here and and it's it's here. But where am I? All right. Oh man. I'm I'm sorry. I'm leaning on my computer and it go, comes and goes. So Mike, I think you're right. That's a, and that's a good way to put it. Uh, and I think that we saw that in several different instances about those on the lower rungs of the totem pole. Um, Maybe I'd use professional hierarchy or something yeah, like that. Yeah, there must be some <laughs> professional word for totem pole. Yes, Dr. Otis. Yeah, I think, yeah, so right. Uh, I was just gonna comment on this totem pole lower rung thing. I think, when, when I talk about cultural transformation, one of the important parts is, um, is that everyone needs to feel valued. And, um, you know, this is one of the reasons I actually philosophically kind of hated org charts <laughs> because they tend to be vertical and there are people down here and there's people up here. Uh, but at the end of the day, every, it's all a team taking care of patients. Um, and no one really is more important. And again, the metaphor I used to use was my only other experience in life before I became a physician was in a diner. And, and, and bear with me for a moment. When I was a bus boy, which is the low man on the totem pole in a diner, now I'm gonna teach you guys about diner hierarchy. That looks like an unimportant job, right? But at the end of the day, if I don't clean those tables, guess what? Nobody gets to eat and the place goes belly up, right? Then it became a dishwasher, which is moving up the org chart, right? Same thing, it seems like an unimportant job. But at the end of the day, if I don't wash the dishes, nobody gets to eat. And I worked and then I became a short or cook. You get where I'm going here, right? So whose job at the end of the day was most important? And I would argue, and I did this with my employees every, every two weeks when I had new employees, my job as the president, I actually truly believe was the least important job in the hospital because all those other people are interacting every day with every patient or visitor or, or with each other. Mm -hmm. And their jobs are far more important than mine. If I wasn't there, who the hell would notice, right? But if you're an aide isn't there or the therapist isn't there or the physician's not there, everybody notices, right? So I think that's part of the cultural transformation is kind of, and I don't mean this disparaging any of you, but getting away from this concept of, you know, the rungs <laughs> that everybody's important. Everybody has to feel valued or you're just going to be back in the same boat. And, uh, and one of the things I feel is that there is, this is like the river of no return. If you come in at the bottom, how do you work your way up to the top? And, and, and so some of the things about education and, and some of the things that we identified as having a, a pros, progress, a way to, for patients to know if they're getting better and, 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 and for employees to know if they are, you know, actually doing their job and there's a possibility of promotion by going to classes and doing things. And that this all counts and that you just can't sit on the state rolls till you're ready to retire. Because in, in, in my other experiences, I find people who are just waiting for that day. 
So, um, okay. I don't. Do you have anything else on on, on that? Um, I think that we shall, uh, you know, if, uh, if you have thoughts, send them to me and we'll put it in here and we'll try to in, uh, make it smooth. Um, is there any more comments on those responses? Because we're going to move now to the, um, the, the things that Bev sent about the uh, definitions of neglect and abuse. Well, Linda, are you going to circulate it after you and Lori? Yeah, sure. Um, sure. Okay. Because it's Every, everything that we're doing is going to be circulated. Uh, no, but I mean, it's, it's hard for us to, um, some of us learn better and do better by seeing it in front of us. So when you don't share it with us until we're at a meeting and then we don't even so this see was, it, I mean, this you're was just reading it findings. to us. Let me just say, this was the findings of that study. I just put them on paper so I could read them to you. Yes, Kim. yes. Well, that's, I mean, the, I'm not Nancy. sure for some of us that that's that helpful. Right. And I think um, the intent was just to kind of review some of those key findings so that we could generate discussion about any specific recommendations we wanted to put into the survey. Okay. Not, not yeah. as right. we, this wasn't intended to. No, like, this is not the end all be all. This you, is just like. You, this get is you to say yes or well, no, whatever. So, yeah. Well, none of it's going to be an end all be all, I assume, until it's circulated. We all have a chance to have right. our input into yeah. it. Yep, yep. Right. Okay. I just want to say, like, I have to um, jump off in about 15 minutes or so. So, do you have anything you want to say before you go? Sorry. Uh, I mean, probably as we move into the next part of the discussion. Um, I think some of maybe some of my um, anyway, if I don't, like I can, I can insert things into the report for further discussion questions that we have. So. Okay, thanks. Um, if we're gonna move into the stuff we, we got from Beverly, I have a question and that is um, why the, the law that um, OLR cited to us um, was just on abuse and not abuse to neglect. I know that at our last meeting, I circulated to everybody the definitions under PAMI of both abuse and neglect. Right. And somehow neglect is missing from here. Because yeah, abuse I and that neglect that have two. Yeah. yeah. Well, she just it was, got, yeah, it was the neglect that I was yesterday. more uh, interested in. You know, kind of. Yeah, what, and I does the people still have what I circulated last meeting? Yes, yes, yes. Still have that. Okay. I'm I'm just wondering. Um, uh, actually, that's not uh, the next thing we're supposed to be talking about is the community service recommendations. And I oh, found sorry. something. I found something that. Um, was done several years ago that actually had an itemized. It was a report by Dr. Um, North, 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 what, who's the guy that was in charge? Narco? Of, yes, Narco. Narco. And it was, a, it, was a, it was across the board what was going on in Connecticut and the different kinds of services they had. And it, 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 um, it, and it was done by somebody else, um, a friend of mine actually, uh, Madeline Baranowski, who was, um, was a professor of mine at Yale. But I didn't realize that I was just, you know, lugging, you know, I was just actually, what was I just doing? Uh, um, actually surfing the web. And uh, the, this is a, I, I will send it along because it does, it kind of gives you an idea of what they had going on at the time and in community services. So I just found that like uh, early this morning and thought, well, it's a little too late to send out, but I'll send it out for the next meeting. When was it done? This was when you were in Norwich. No, th this was a. This was not. This was done. Let me just look here. I, I um. I don't know if I still have it on my. Uh.
I'm sorry. I uh, let me see if I can Google it or actually get it from my own. Uh, Can I offer a, a comment about the community services piece? Sure. So in case I do have to jump off. Um, so just kind of in sticking with the same themes uh, that we've been talking about with everything else, um, particularly with regard to accountability, um, I'm just, I'm wondering if there can be a way to enforce or expect or have the same kind of accountability for the community-based programs and services as we've been talking about for the hospitals as well, like so they have to be able to report we, data on things. Um, we, we did we did put that in as a recommendation that we we felt it wasn't just for CBH and Whiting; it should be applicable to all of the uh, uh, services and programs of Demas and those funded by Demas, because I think you know we were talking about some of these group homes that have twenty people living in the same place. And they're all using so you know that there's just but they're supported so um yeah i'm, I'm thinking <laughs> thinking too of the um in terms of the um like the numbers um so i know that they the, they just constructed that uh website um paul you told us about it uh, yeah that has like sort of all the places in the state and and where there's beds and not but that still relies on like an individual person to input that data um, and I don't know that it's always accurate or, or I should say, I know that it's not always accurate. So something, some sort of arm or mechanism that would make that, uh, more accountable so that people know here is exactly where the beds are available so that, you know, where you can discharge people to get them out of the hospitals that, um, providers are, um, uh, some, I've spoke before about how uh, some of the difficulties that we have in getting people accepted in some of the community programs. And I think some of that needs to um, be more flexible. I think that there needs to be um, some greater latitude or opening about that so that we can, so we can get people out of the hospital when they're ready to go and aren't told no, um, or aren't told we don't have a bed or aren't told oh. no, they're not on medication. We're not going to accept them. I mean, those kinds of things I think shouldn't be acceptable. So you, so you guys have had places refuse people because they aren't on medications. <laughs> oh yeah, I see that all the time. Really? Oh I yeah. Can, I, I can That's astounding remember. because it's actually in the patient's bill of rights that you have the right to refuse medication. So absolutely. I think and not that, everybody, not everybody that comes for competency restoration necessarily has a major psychiatric illness. So, and I do remember a time we had a patient who was just really in need of a, a bed and we could call a place. I'm in Norwich. This one was down in the Bridgeport area. <laughs> they couldn't, uh, there was no way to get her there. So we paid for uh, an aide and, and to go in the, in the, uh, with her to the hospital in a cab because we just needed to get her off the street. It was, it was winter. So the name of this document, and it so, is, let me just say, if it, it was a 2015, it was called The Evolution of Forensic Services in Connecticut. And I thought it was, you know, showed us what was going on before. So I'll just send it to you. You can do anything you want to, but I found it interesting how many communities and all this were engaged because it, it proved that one time we were, Connecticut was capable of doing this and we need to go back there. Okay. So on, on, on the bed thing, Lori, I know with uh, detox centers, they updated every morning. Would that be helpful with, with the beds then to make that recommendation? That, that because I know, like, like I know a lot of the supported housing that like that, you, you would, you would paint the housing three or four times before it turns over. Um, mm -hmm. so that can be very slow, but I think that there's probably <laughs> some, some forms of housing and programs where it would make sense to have a daily update. Mm -hmm. And, and I think right now, if I remember correctly, it's weekly yeah. for, for, for psych beds, like I was saying and for deep. Yeah. You know, I mean, 
I don't know if it, I don't know if it matters so much if it's daily or weekly, um, but it matters that it's accurate and it matters that it doesn't, you know, in my, all right. So it was my dream world that this website even existed in the first place. So I'm super happy about that. But in my, in my next dream world, it would be like completely electronic so that as somebody is being admitted into a program, like as they're admitted into whatever system, like that automatically updates this, you know, website so that it doesn't um, require a human to, um, I guess, you know, uh, accurately update it. Um, because I, I, like I said, I think I there's way that, too many individual systems that have to communicate with themselves. Probably. Yeah. But I, I definitely think there needs to be some stronger arm of accountability about acceptance and, and maybe criteria or um, something to that effect. Cause, cause as I said, we've had, we've struggled for years to try to get people accepted. And sometimes and then magically, like as it works its way up the, um, not to use the totem pole reference, but as it works its way up the, you know, kind of supervisory manager uh, chain, magically it happens and the person's accepted. But there's a lot of pushback at the lower levels. And sometimes it is for reasons such as that. They're not on medication. Um, you know, they, they had an assault charge 10 years ago uh, you know, things like that. I mean, just. Well, I remember a time when uh, the uh, substance abuse, you, some of the places, the treatment facilities, they had to be high or drunk out of their minds to come through the door before they'd take them. And uh, so that's, uh, that's where it is. But um, I will send those things out to you. I'll send kind of, the PERCH report was not as um, big because it was actually focus groups, but I will send you some of the findings of that. And I think we all have that document, don't we? we yeah. Yeah. To look at it and see, but I, I, the things that I was looking for is a before and after, or do we have a, a, a bona fide trend, the river of no return? And then as I was doing this, uh, as we talked about earlier, it occurred to me that we're just seeing the same things over and over and over again. Okay. So um, we have the PSRB, the 2017 to 2021 data. Who asked for that? That, that was a question I had posed um, oh, a while okay. back. Um, <laughs> And I had asked for a clarification to get the more because the the suggestion was right, right, right. something had changed and and they, they gave us the aggregate numbers for that very long period of time. I just want to see, is it true that the recent experience has been very different than the previous experience? That was my question. Did, Did we, we get, get anything back on that? Yeah. Did yeah, we? I didn't. Yeah. When was was that? Yeah, we did. What? Yeah. Um, so, we got last week. yeah, they sent, they sent a table, a, a chart that had mm -hmm. the, up the specific information for 2017 to 2021. So it breaks down the percent of approval for transfer out of max, conditional release, temporary leave, um, and then the specific numbers. So Who sent looking it so at it as, as the whole, what's that? Who sent it so I can find it? Yeah, I'm looking for it myself. Yeah. I'm not sure who I got. Pretty it sure Bev sent it. I thought Bev, I thought Beverly sent yeah, it too. Yeah, yeah, she sent it on July 19th. Got it. Oh, okay. A week ago, yeah. Uh, I think it all, you know, remember the conversation we had that Paul, I think, was part of. We, we were talking about you know, what's the purpose of the PSRB. And the question was, do they approve, if they don't approve everybody, or do they approve everybody? And had there been a trend over time, right? That was the conversation right. we were having. So this was to show that, you know, the majority, I guess, uh, to conclude, you know, it seemed over time, the overwhelming and majority move on but not everybody oh i'm sorry i i do have it okay see it now and i i, I was um like my my purpose in asking for that data i guess was because i had heard from others at the hospital and my own sort of anecdotal sense or experience was that people were moving through the system more rapidly than they had in the past um and so I thought maybe, you know, things were being approved um, 
more often. So the, the sense that I've gotten from other folks is that um, we've been essentially asking for more things for more patients, like asking them to either for them to move along through the system or for things to be modified to give them um, more freedoms, more privileges, more independence, that kind of, you know, like moving in that direction. Uh, and that the board had been improving things a little bit less, but that the net result was that patients were gaining more than they had in the past. So that's, again, I say that as that's a sense uh, that I have from talking with other folks at the hospital. So I was kind of looking for some of the data around that to um, substantiate it. This data doesn't really kind of get at the fine detail of things, uh, I think, but, um, you know, at any rate, that was kind of the, the purpose in doing that. Um, can I just say also, I, I do have to sign off um, right now, but if you guys go on to talk about the abuse and neglect, um, I will, I guess I'll just add my my commentary or my input that the definition of, a, of neglect that was in the original um, I think things that Nancy circulated, not most recently, but like from before is the one that I, I find, I guess, um, to be the best, not the more recent one. So, um, but that being said, I'll have to sign off and. All right. Talk to you Thanks, early Lauren. next week. Have okay. a good weekend, Lauren. Bye. 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 Okay. So, um, th I, I do, I did have it. I'm sorry. I the um, the whiting um, about the um, the PSRB. So I'm, uh, does any does anybody have any commentary on the findings or what is published here? I I know there's like five uh, pages of. Any interpretations? I'm not going to take a, a shot here. I, I'm looking at. A hundred percent of all of the, the leave and. What do you see all of you who have been in the business for a while? What do you see when you look at this? Numbers that really don't mean anything. Okay. To me. <laughs> I mean, because I, you, you would have to start with the premise that the PSRB is always 100% correct in order for these percentages to mean anything. Well, and, and, and the thing is, I, I would like to know what the PSRB saw different than what the treaters saw in order to deny someone. Because I think that that's more of the important question. Um, because, you know, I, I think I've been pretty clear that I think the PSRB is just redundant. Um, but I think that, you know, we, we really don't have uh, why they turn someone down, um, you know, and, and does the PSRB have more forensic expertise than the people at Whiting? I don't think so. And I, I think we should be trusting the providers because they're making the same mistakes the PSRB is in some ways, um, you know, and, and I don't think that this is a mechanism that's going to have us have better outcomes, but that's my two cents. You, you did not see anything in this data that changed your mind? No. Well, it might. You know, I'll, I'll admit I didn't super analyze it, but my impression from what I saw last week was that the overall majority of cases brought before the PSRB are, are approved to move forward, right? The problem, as Paul has pointed out, I think if it, you know, so you can't win here, right? Because if it's, if, the, if they approve 100%, then it clearly supports Paul's argument that they're superfluous. They're just another cog in the process. They just slow things down. What's the point, right? If they only right. approve 50%, to, again, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase Paul, then it's like, well, wait a minute, how do they know better than the providers, clinicians who are caring for the patients? So so it's, I it's think the point, the point Paul just made, though, very important. I think it'd be great if we actually, if they had to give a reason for why, you know, they're, are they concerned about safety? They think whatever the argument is, I think that might help us. But when you see it's over the over, the bottom line is the overall majority they agree with whatever the clinicians said, right? Which again, it goes back to then. So what's the point? 
I agree. That's my, that's my yeah, that's opinion. a good point. Mm -hmm. And I, the other piece, though, that I think is missing is um, what are the criteria that the clinical staff is using to refer folks to the PSRB? Are they cherry picking cases that they think are going to be approved um, and not presenting cases that they think clinically should be approved, but they know how the PSRB works. And so, so those figures don't really mean anything unless we know how the clinical staff is making their referrals and who are they not referring? Yeah, because I, I, I highly doubt the PSRB has moved someone along that the clinical people didn't present. Right, right. It all comes from the clinical people. And, and as we heard, I mean, I kind of picked this up when we had that meeting with the, the uh, in Dr. Oh, we're not, we're not, I'm not ready for that yet. You know, it's like, um, <laughs> It's, I, I've also had, uh, under the old, old tyranny of when they actually had hearings uh, in, in state hospitals, uh, and you, you just hoped to God that your patient would get some more privileges or get a leave or something, and you could always find something. So it was, I just have to say that your, your point is well taken, that what does this tell us that, why do we need this group? Awesome. It supports our notion, our recommendation. Okay. We'll just enter that as proof of why we why it shouldn't be. But do you think if we if we ask for a generalization of the reasons for denial and or reason, yeah, denial, do you think we'd get anything from them? Well, that, that's actually one of the questions that I put through that I thought what had gotten approved by the Public Health Committee that we never heard back on. Want to ask it again? Yes. <laughs> if, 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 it's, if it's something that can take place quickly, you know, because I, I want to be mindful that, you know, we're, we're way, pet, you know, it's good for us to get a report done. <laughs> All right, um, you, can you send the question again and I'll send it on to them? Because I, I think that um, something was lost on the translation. So we'll just. Okay, yeah. Should, should I send that to you, Linda? Or yeah, because um, I think um, Bev is on vacation for a while. I don't know. I think she's coming back next week, but we'll, I'll, I'll just say that this came up. And I'm. We want to re. We want to revisit this. Are there any other things we should put in here? Nancy, I, I think uh, not. Nancy, sorry, uh, Linda. Uh, Kate Hamilton is sitting in for Beverly, and she's quite competent, and I'm sure she can convey any of our requests. Uh, in in. Beverly I would just like to. You send it to Kate then. Okay, Kate. Right, Kate. Sounds great. I'll send it to me and I'll take care of it. <clears throat> yeah, because we want it to be in just what he what he was saying we wanted. And the, I'm asking the other members, is there any other uh, questions that we want? If you can... All right. So is there anything else we need to be attending to? I think we've finished the agenda or we have deferred some of this. Uh, for a later discussion. Is there anything else we should be discussing today? We want to also, Kate, we want to say from OLR, did you catch this? That we got a lot of um, definitions of abuse, but not neglect. And we'd like that to be revisited uh, so that we can see that. And I will send out the community service recommendations. I'll send out some of that work from uh, years, from a few years back that kind of consolidate what was happening in the uh, system. And we will, uh, Lori and I will rework so everybody will have it before the next meeting. What we what we uh, see as 
how after talking with you, what are the what, how we should conceptualize the hearing the uh, survey findings? And I will just tell you that um, I'm glad you all kind of agreed today that this is stuff. This stuff is not new because I think we should say that in the summer. We need to say that, you know, we've done this and we came up with these recommendations. It's the best we, we our best thinking, but the will to change, we, we, we can be excited about it, but that really has to come uh, from the legislature and, and the governor's office. Yes, Paul. Linda, I, I would like to take that one step for, forward and reference the 1970 report from Fairfield Hills that reported the same stuff going on in a different facility. <laughs> so, Hill. yeah, um, Kat, uh, Kathy Flaherty gave us that. All right, I'll look at back, it. Way back in another lifetime. Well, I, 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 yes, I, I mean... It, it, as I was writing this and looking and trying to be comprehensive, I just said to myself, you know, we're spinning our wheels if they don't do anything. They, and, and uh, so we, we have to challenge them. We have to challenge the notion that it's, it's something that needs to be done. We have to challenge them. Task, having a task force, that's, um, that's nice, but um, it, change has to happen. Well, I think to Lori's point, though, too, I think you know we do have a lot of good, solid, clear recommendations. Because uh, I think the more nebulous uh, we are, the less it's going to happen. Um, and now, obviously, we have no control of what really happens, right? But at least well, we need to be as clear as clear as we can uh, about what we think needs to be done. I, 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 uh, um, I. I have kind of fleshed out the themes that we have been, you know, talking about the accountability and uh, patients' rights, and why does it have to be different? And is this a hospital? Is this a jail? Or is this uh, a warehouse? And um, um, the state has already decided that it's Whiting Forensic Hospital. Oh, okay. Well, um, but 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 I agree with you, Linda, that there that you know there's some real structural work that needs to be done here, and we just can't slap a coat of paint on this and say all oh, better now. No, and I um, I hope that they do use this. Um, so many programs that the state of Connecticut has had for a long time. Some of them have suffered um, with, with budgetary issues, but at the same time, you have to be a little bit more creative about what's going on if you're really engaged in what it is you're trying to do. So um, with that, I will say, is there any more business to come before the task force? Nancy. Uh, I just wanted to say, as I added before, and let's remember in this, this whole discussion about PSRB and sort of what's the point of it, it's also the sentences, the length of the sentences are so disproportionate to All right, will you happens. write something up so we can just put it in there? You just say the length of sure. the sentences and why are they so disproportionately long? Sure. I, 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 some of this, um, now I was born and raised in the state of Ohio, but compared to some of the things that, Ohio is a little bit ahead of, on some things, but they were really pretty bad back in the day. So, yeah. and we have the talent. Connecticut has the talent to make this happen. We have people that are, you know, world renowned, uh, um, world renowned experts. We just need to tap into, we know what to do, let's do it. Okay, folks. I'm going to say have a wonderful weekend. Is anybody? Wait, let's, saw, let's confirm our next meeting. 
Oh, all right. I'm going to tell you something. I cannot be here on the 14th, uh, the 13th. I can't be here. I have to, I have a family obligation out of state. So you want to do the uh, 20th? Yes, let's do the 20th. And then we should, we should, what, what Lori and I were going to try to do is get this stuff out to you a few days before we have the meeting. And we have a lot to get to you. So yeah, the 20th, does that work for people? I'm just looking. Uh, August 20th, Friday, yep, 1.30. Yep. Mm -hmm. Putting it in. Okay. Okay. Can, can, can someone it, get if this it, out? If it's that voluminous, can we get it more than a few days? Yeah. Uh, like how many days? I, I, I'm, I'm going to be leaving on Friday. Doesn't mean I'll stop working, but oh. you mean the stuff that I promised you now or the whole report? Well, you, you, you said that before a few days before the 20th, you were going to get us the report and that it's voluminous. And I'd, I'd definitely no, no, like no, a no. few more days. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll let you know. We we talked about what was a. Uh, it's not going to be voluminous. It's not. It's not pages and pages and pages. It's succinct. Can someone let Lori know the uh, change of date? Yes, I told her I had a problem with the next one, and she, so um, no, it's. It will have attachments, but it won't have. It's very succinct. All those in favor of uh, adjourning? Aye. We are adjourned. Okay.